Welcome back to the Neurosymbolic Channel. I'm Paolo Shakarian, and also with me is uh, Gerardo Samari, uh, my longtime colleague. And today we have uh, Professor Joao Leite uh, from Nova University in Lisbon. He's been doing some really interesting work on deriving logical theories that can explain uh, neural models. So Joao, uh, nice to have you on the channel. Well, uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So uh, maybe if we could start, maybe if you could kind of talk about some of your professional background and sort of, uh, you know, what have you done that's caused you to land at the intersection of machine learning and, and symbolic AI? Okay. Well, uh, I, I started working in AI back when I started doing my master's dissertation all the way in the 90s. And uh, the 90s were a strange time to do AI because we were right in the middle of the AI winter. Uh, and also because there was this huge divide between people working on symbolic AI and working on sub-symbolic or connectionist uh, AI. And then back then, the, the, the discussions between these people, between these two camps were quite fierce. And very few people, almost no one was considering bridging these two approaches. Perhaps the exception was uh, Stefan Holdobler, who was already in the 90s, he was looking into this. Um, but uh, back then, when I picked the topic of my dissertation, I ended up doing something in logic programming. And it's interesting because that kind of shaped uh, what followed, uh, which was a research career mostly devoted to knowledge representation and reasoning, so the symbolic side of AI. Uh, however, I never really identified with this big divide between these two camps. Even in the 90s, I kind of remember uh, reading papers essentially from cognitive scientists on the connection between symbolic and sub-symbolic approaches. And this wish to investigate this connection was always in the background. Uh, in, I mean, I've always believed uh, and still do that the path forward to AI is to bridge uh, these two areas, but I kept postponing it. Uh, I mean, as you can imagine, it's not always easy to make such a significant change, uh, not only because it takes a lot of time and, uh, I mean, being an academic, a lot of times the bureaucracy just takes up all your time, but also because there's there's a significant shift in the way research is conducted. I mean, whereas in the past I was mostly proving theorems, uh, now I most often uh, am conducting experiments, looking for empirical evidence. And so this is why it, it was always present, this, uh, uh, this wish to investigate the connection between both fields, but only recently that, uh, should I say, things aligned somehow and, and, and made this shift uh, uh, possible. I think one of the things that made it possible to explore these ideas was that I, um, I recruited two very good PhD students. They're the co-authors of the two papers I'm going to be talking about. One is Manuel de Souza Ribeiro. He's further along in his PhD and João Ferreira. And it was through discussions with them that we kind of realized, okay, maybe it's time to, to invest uh, more seriously in this area. And this is how I got here. Oh, that's kind of interesting. I mean, I've, um, you know, I've come across a number of, of faculty members, and I'll, I'll even put myself in this category where um, folks that have been doing logic programming their careers, you know, in the last five, 10 years, it seems all the PhD students that they recruit come with a lot of knowledge about machine learning. Is, is that, was that a contributor to this? Well, it to be honest, it really wasn't, okay? Because the, the, when I started working with uh, my student, Manuel, he was uh, still very early in his undergraduate degree, actually. And so he was still kind of not really shaped towards one side or the other. It's true that our degree has a, a strong focus on machine learning, like most degrees have nowadays. But interestingly, it also has a very strong focus on knowledge representation. So I think the good point about these students is that they have a good understanding of both sides of, of AI. And, and that's something that's become more uh, rare nowadays because KR and knowledge representation is being uh, taken out many of the syllabus 
and, and it's being replaced with machine learning. So the good point here is that they have both very good knowledge of both fields, which made it a lot easier to, 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 to start in this in these topics. No, it makes a lot of sense. And and you're right about uh that like KR is is being removed from a lot of syllabi. Um I you know I've been putting together an AI course and in doing that I was just looking at syllabi from other universities and it's it's surprising to see how many AI courses at, at various places are really ML courses now. Um and and I think some of what has been standard is maybe a little bit lost. So well, I think just a quick comment. Um, I think it's it's not to say that it's reasonable that it's happening, but the, the field has been growing so much that now it's like I remember when I when I started my undergrad in the 90s, like there was one AI course and you could more or less cover a lot, a lot of what was going on in like one class. Um but now, like we have so much, so much uh, development in in each of the of the camps, both in KR and in in ML, that just one one single course is not going to be enough to cover it in, in sufficient depth, I guess. And and also what Joao was just saying about the 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 way that research is conducted reminded me of multidisciplinary research, which is kind of uh, funny because it's you know we're we're in the same discipline. But it is, again, it, because it, it grew so much that now the both both sides have diverted uh, enough that uh, we don't recognize the the methods uh, from one side uh, looking at the other. And, and it's interesting because uh, when, when speaking with people doing more of the uh, sub symbolic uh, neural network based stuff, many of them don't even identify with being researchers in artificial intelligence. They're researchers in machine learning, which then has many uh, applications, and one of them in, in their mind is uh, is AI. But they don't necessarily see themselves as people doing AI, which is interesting. That, that might also be because of the influx from other disciplines, right? Like physicists, maybe, or other other kinds of engineers um, coming coming to to AI, but not from CS, which was the, the traditional way of getting into it. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting point. You know, and thinking about kind of this um, almost going full circle from what we're talking about, and now we have a, a confluence of, uh, you know, symbolic AI and machine learning. You know, what are your thoughts on kind of the recent popularity of, of neurosymbolic AI? There's, you know, now that, you know, this workshop that, uh, uh, Pascal uh, Hitzler and, and Louis Lamb and others have organized is now a conference. There's uh, the number of neurosymbolic papers to conferences like Triple AI and NeurIPS uh, has been, you know, growing, you know, uh, by almost an order of magnitude year over year. Um, you know, it. You know, what are your thoughts on this growing? Do you think it's something that's going to keep happening, or you think it's maybe a, a flash in the pan? I think it will only grow because uh, actually it's interesting because the, 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 I think there's two phenomena there. One is uh, that the people, a lot of people working on KR, are now looking at neurosymbolic as a good way to apply what they've learned and what they know from the KR. Uh, side of, of AI. And, and on its own, that would be, I think, enough to grow an event such as the, the, the workshop into a conference and all these sessions in major AI conferences. But I think one of the things that strikes me as, uh, as a, perhaps a stronger sign that this uh, is important and it will grow is to listen to machine learning people uh, saying that, or some of them saying that they're approaching a bit of a dead end and the next step requires knowledge, uh, either in terms of an inductive bias when uh, when uh, uh, teaching or learning the models or at some different level, be it to impose constraints on whatever the models do. I now, I now hear 
and see a lot of people from that side uh, saying one way or another, sometimes they don't even express it as a need for KR, but their problems and the problems they're investigating really require at some point uh, knowledge representation. And I think that's a clear indication that this is a field that's going to uh, flourish. Now, uh, of course, the problem is that it, it, it's very difficult. I mean, it, it's not like these people working, me including in, in, in neurosymbolic AI, are exploring uncharted territory. I mean, for many years, people have thought about the connection between these two things, even if only a few people, only to come across very serious obstacles that might require some breakthroughs that we have no idea what they are at the moment. But to me, it's quite clear that if we want some sort of uh, AI that I'm not going to say the full general AI that people talk about, but something along those lines or closer to those lines, it, it will need both sides. It will need the sub-symbolic machine learning part, but it will also need symbols. It will need reasoning. And, and these things need to be in tandem working together. So uh, I don't see that as a, a fling of the moment. I see this as a uh, a steady because it it it, it answers a, a real problem and the need. So it, it will. The only reason why it will not flourish is if we just hit uh, some walls that we can't uh, get past. Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. I I mean it's you know I think there's in it's inherently challenging, right? I mean you um the divide between you know uh, going from a vector representation to a consistent symbolic representation um and i know that's you know now we're starting to touch on uh specific areas relating to your work maybe this would be a good time to get into some of your your findings yeah uh so uh... The, the 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 first thing that that led uh, us to to start working on this, uh, and of course there are many angles that you can think about when you think about combining these two things. But for us was uh, really going from a sub symbolic model into a symbolic one. So uh, our starting point was these neural networks are great; they do amazing things. But uh, we would like to know what's going on inside of them. Uh, People often put it as the, the area of explainable AI, but try to come up with explanations for these neural networks. And uh, and of course, the main problem, we all know this, is that uh, their models, the internal representations are just based on n-dimensional Euclidean spaces. So there's no way a human can really understand what's going on in those models. Um, uh, but, and, 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 and so the, the, the first, uh, our first observation if you will, was uh, that in order to come up with an explanation for what goes on inside the neural network, the first thing that we need is some concepts that humans understand. So for me, explanations are things for humans, uh, and humans understand concepts, understand symbols. They don't understand matrices of, of numbers. And, uh, and usually these explanations they're based on they're based on the language, and more often than not, uh, they they point they, or they sequences of why questions, if you wish, uh, that to some extent require symbols and require uh, some uh, knowledge about how these symbols uh, relate. And if you want to automate it, some reasoning mechanism like deduction, abduction, or uh, whatever. But but the important point to us was that explanations depend on on the receiver of the explanation and they're not some things that exist on their own uh, think for example uh, that if a doctor medical doctor is trying to explain something the kind of concepts that he's going to use if he's explaining something to a fellow doctor are going to be completely different than the concepts that he would use if he was trying to explain the same thing to a patient or to someone else and it's this observation that no matter what uh, the, repre the internal representations people have of some phenomenon, they're usually able to adapt uh, their discourse, their speech to whatever language is understood 
by the recipient of this exploitation. We often use another example. If, if, if you think of a climber, one of the guys that climbs walls or climbs mountains, they have a very good uh, experience and let's call it intrinsic or personal uh, uh, understanding of the forces and triangulation, so on and so forth. Uh, but if you ask them to explain what's going on, they might not be able to explain it to you. But if you maybe explain or give them some concepts about some uh, uh, coordinate system, like a Cartesian one or the spherical one, they might be able to translate what they're experiencing into that system and convey explanations based on those concepts. And so it was uh, looking at this idea that the concepts exist because someone knows those concepts associated with that particular domain that we decided, okay, let's uh, uh, let's try uh, to see whether we can somehow connect a neural network and uh, these uh, concepts. So we start with a network, that it's what the network we want to explain, and a set of concepts, the words, whatever, that uh, whoever is going to receive the explanation understands about the domain. Uh, but the, then the million dollar question is how to connect these two things. And what we tried to do was kind of looking at what neuroscientists do. They can now look at images of the brain, dynamic ones, and, and, and see that some there are some patterns of activations in our neurons that correspond to certain concepts. And we thought that maybe we could do the same thing. Uh, not necessarily finding one neuron uh, that was exactly representing that particular concept, but perhaps uh, find patterns of activations of the neurons that could respond that would correspond to those uh, uh, to those concepts, and that that that's the core of idea from what all the other things that we've done follow. This idea that uh, for each concept of interest to the human that's trying to find an explanation, maybe we can train another classifier, another neural network, whose input of the neural network are the activations of the network we're trying to explain. Let's call it the main network. So that's the input of these classifiers, and the output is one of these concepts, okay? And that's what we try to do. We try to, to train some of these, uh, many of these networks, one for each of these concepts. We call them mapping networks because they map the main network into these concepts. We try to teach uh, 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 these networks to identify concepts in the, in the activations of the main uh, uh, network. So if uh, if I can quickly uh, uh, share a couple of slides yeah, just please. To, uh, with uh, what I am saying. Just... Okay, uh, so the, the idea is imagine we start with a neural network, just a regular normal neural network. And let's imagine that we have this set of concepts, we call them un human understandable concepts. And uh, then the idea is that we're going to train these mapping networks. So each of them connects to the activations of the neurons of the main network, and each of them will have as output, so direct as classifier, output one of these concepts of interest. And then what uh, we did, and that's the, the, the first part of our work, was try to figure out whether all this makes any sense, okay? Because one thing is to have an idea, the other thing is to see whether it works. And so what we did was we tried to look at several, uh, answer several questions which we thought would be evidence that this thing was working. The first one was whether, uh, whether there would be a difference in our ability to extract a concept if the concept was relevant, so at least according to our understanding, was relevant to the task of the main network versus one that was completely irrelevant. Then we tried to look at the cost of the mapping, whether there would be some benefit of looking inside the neural network or just looking at the input of the main network. Uh, we also tried to figure out the meaning of these extracted concepts, whether these concepts that were being extracted actually correspond to our understanding of those concepts or whether the network was just picking up some, 
other correlations which have nothing to do with our understanding of those concepts. And then also at the origin of the concepts, uh, do we have to really look at the entire network as the input to these mapping networks, or can we identify some certain areas uh, 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 or certain sets of neurons which are enough for us to map this, uh, to, to make these mappings? Now, in order- so Great question. Uh, so, uh, uh, could you explain relevant versus non-relevant? Is that like a is there like a formal definition there? Okay, there is a formal definition uh, if we have enough information, uh, uh, and and you'll see what I mean by this. But the idea. So let's imagine uh, that we have uh, uh, an ontology, for example, of our domain. Okay, we have an ontology, and let's imagine that we even have. Uh, a, an axiom uh, describing the output of the main network. So in this case, a relevant concept will be any concept such that by changing its uh, truth value in some situation, we will be able to change the truth value of the axiom describing the main network. Okay, So this would be in logical terms. If there is some interpretation whereby flipping one, you would also uh, require to flip the other one to maintain uh, consistency, if you wish. Okay, now when it comes, if you don't have the ontology, we can talk it, about it in, in lay terms, not lay terms, sorry, but not formal terms. And a concept would be uh, relevant for the main network if by uh, changing uh, the, the that feature of the input, it can be uh, something on the input or some part of an image. If by changing that in some image, we could cause a change in the output of the neural network. Okay, uh, so in uh, an example would be the temperature uh, is relevant for us to decide whether someone has COVID, for example. Whereas the the color of the door of my office is obviously not relevant for a neural network being trained to 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 uh, to 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 classify whether someone has COVID or not, okay? So okay. It, it, it's still informal. So if we have enough information, we can define it formally. With uh, less information, this would be as close as I could get to a definition of, of relevancy. Now, this is also interesting because uh, the, all these experiments that we conducted in these two papers, not all of them, but many of them, are based on a synthetic uh, data set uh, that has enough of this knowledge so that we can know what's going on, even if we only use it to test our things and not to train our models. So let me uh, give you a little bit about this data set uh, very quickly, uh, just to, 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 to illustrate. So it's a data set that's based on uh, uh, the uh, uh, Mikalski strains. I'm sure you've come across Mikalski strains there, an old data set uh, whose goal was to induce logical uh, formula for, for, for trains, for representations of trains. And what we did was we created a data set uh, that, that, that's available. It's called X trains. And basically, it creates on backgrounds, on random backgrounds of images, it creates representations of trains with different sorts of carriages, of wagons, with things inside, with noise around it, uh, so that we would try to, on the one hand, have a data set that has uh, features that common data sets like noise and variation have, but at the same time, it was controlled enough so that we, we have labels for all the types of shapes, all the types of, of wagons and trains that each picture has. So all experiments that we do, we can always control with what would be some ground truth about this, uh, this, uh, this data set. And then we also, ultimately, we want to, to, to explain some neural networks. What, what we did was we trained three neural networks, um, each of them trying to classify a particular type of train. And the descriptions of these trains were just based on low-level features of the trains. So just to give you an example, for example, trains of type A are trains having either a wagon with at least a circle inside and a wagon with two walls in each side or no wagon with geometric figures inside of them. So there were just like three 
kind of, well, I'm not going to say random, but uh, pretty much close to that neural networks uh, classifying a particular type of train. And as I mentioned, one of the good things about this data set will try uh, this neural symbolic stuff is that with it, we have an ontology. This is just an excerpt, uh, a little bit of that ontology, but it relates these concepts. So, uh, for example, uh, we, we use a concept which we call passenger car to represent a wagon containing at least a circle inside it, and so on and so forth. And then this ontology, what it does is it takes some low-level concepts, then it builds some higher-level concepts on top of the lower ones, so wagon-level uh, concepts. Then on top of that, it defines even more complex concepts like trains of a certain kind, so war trains, long trains, so on and so forth. And on top of that, it defines the type A and type B and type C trains, okay? So again, this is just for us because we have all these labels together with images so that we know what's going on with each image and we can control uh, things, okay? So the first experiment uh, that we did was to check whether we could extract those relevant concepts more easily than the non-relevant, okay? If this thing makes any sense, we would expect that the concepts that affect the output should be able to be extracted more easily than the other ones. And so we selected 11 of the concepts randomly from the ontology, and we tried it. And what we could observe is that in general, the relevant concepts can be extracted with higher accuracy than the non-relevant concepts. In other words, when we train one of those mapping networks for a concept which we believe, we can test it with the ontology, but which we believe to be relevant, then we can usually train that uh, mapping network with high accuracy, whereas for concepts which are not relevant at all for the output of the network, uh, we uh, sometimes cannot uh, train at all, and sometimes we can train, but with very or with much lower uh, accuracy. Okay, so uh, on its own, these results suggest that it's possible uh, to extract these uh, human defined concepts from neural networks as long as they're relevant to the task being performed by the main uh, network. So, um, on this, uh you have a bunch of other concepts that it also extracts accurately. Uh, mm -hmm. Why is that the case? Because there's also a lot of a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, um, correlations, I would say, between the two things. So bear in mind that we're looking at all the neur all the neurons, okay, uh, to start with. And by looking at all the neurons, there might be features which almost correspond to those concepts that are close to the input. And then just by looking at them, you can still train a classifier that's simple enough, like these mapping networks, in order to extract it. OK? Would, um, would uh, concepts relating to the negation of the target class also be considered relevant in your definition? Well, we don't distinguish positive from negative. We're just taking a concept. Actually, all, all these things are just propositional, okay? So if uh, if by flipping from true to, to, to false is, uh, is relevant, I would expect uh, the, the opposite to also be the case. But we, we don't deal with negation as such, okay? We okay. just take any concept to be a, a proposition uh, uh, unrelated to, to, to its negation, okay? Okay. At this level, at least so far, okay? Later on, it might it will be different, okay? Uh, so the, 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 the next thing that we looked for was what we call uh, the cost of the mappings. So, uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned, nothing would prevent me from training one of these mapping networks not looking at what goes on inside of the neural network, but looking at the data set itself, okay? That would be a possibility, right? Uh, so, but that's not what we want. We want to really look at, uh, at the inside of the network, but it, 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 this mapping networks and this mapping of concepts would make sense if really somehow the concept was already, I'm going to say latent, in the activations of the main network. Otherwise, it would be as easy to, to train these mapping networks from the main network as it would be from the data set. 
So we conducted a series of experiments and we see, we try to look how many samples would we need in order to train these mapping networks as, com as compared to the number of samples that we need if we were going to train it using the samples themselves and not the neurons. And the results were quite interesting, okay? As you can see, you have two lines. The one on top is the accuracy you can get from the mapping networks when you use uh, the, the activations of the main network, whereas the one in the bottom is when you look at, uh, 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 when you just train a, 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 a convolutional neural network from the samples themselves, from the data set directly, almost ignoring the or completely ignoring the main network that you're trying to explain. And as you can see from this line, you can very quickly, with very few samples, by looking inside the network, you can very quickly uh, train the mapping network. Whereas if you had to train it all the way from the images, from the input samples, it would require a lot more, uh, a lot more uh, samples. Okay. So uh, in our opinion, and, and, and interestingly, this, is, this happens to, uh, to many of uh, uh, the, actually to all of the, of the concepts that we've been trying out. In all of them, you see that you can much easier, it's much easier to, to train the, the mapping network than to train from scratch a network to identify that concept. So the, the, this kind of highlights two main benefits of using these mapping networks. First, the, overhaul, the overhead caused by their development is minimal, okay, uh, because the model is much simpler than otherwise would have been necessary. And then the amount of required label data for training it with the same accuracy is usually much smaller. Bear in mind that uh, labeling the data set with these concepts that we want to extract is the big cost of this method, okay? And so, requiring very uh, or much uh, smaller number of samples is quite good in terms of the cost of the method, okay? So is a, uh, this is a really compelling result, um, but I guess my question here is that, is the dimensionality of the input uh, much greater for the mapping neural network than the CNN? And um, if so, you know, is there a cost in terms of the number of weights for the mapping network, especially since you have to have a bunch of them? Well, I guess you have to have a bunch of convolutionals anyway, so. Yeah, yeah, ultimately we, we, we are comparing, uh, of course, so first the, 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 this is true for this data set, okay? And we need to experiment with that other data sets. But um, here we are really comparing uh, two direct ways of, of, of looking at concepts into the data set uh, through the main network or directly from the data set, okay? And, uh, and that, that, that's all we're doing. And, and what, what, what this tells us is two things. The first one, we need much fewer data, but also the fact that these mapping networks, they're very simple networks, okay? They're networks that are not more than very few neurons, okay? It means that the concept is really close by, so to say, that we really, that there, there's a pattern of activations of the main network that's very close to these concepts. I don't know if I answered your question or not. No, I, I guess that makes sense. So, um, yeah, yeah, and that, that's a n nice intuition. Be so let me see if I understand what you're saying there is that the cost of creating the mapping network itself is small. The network doesn't need a lot of neurons. And it's essentially because the concept is latent in the main network originally. And these are essentially providing kind of extra layers on that to just get a different target class. Exactly. That, that would be a, a good understanding of what I was trying to say. Yes. OK, cool. Okay. Is, is it useful also for avoiding um, overfitting? Uh, in in what sense? Uh, uh... Well, if you have the concepts um, guiding the learning process, then you're probably not going to 
uh, go astray and, you know, as, as overfitting does when, when it looks at, at things okay. that aren't really relevant to the, to the concepts yeah, but, that you're but, looking for. But bear in mind that we are not guiding the learning process of the main network. Okay. So actually this method doesn't touch the, the, the doesn't change the, the, the main uh, network model. Okay. So that is given to us and we just apply this method by looking what's going inside, but we haven't, we don't, really guides its training. So it, it just so happens that when the main network is classifying the types of trains that we're classifying, it somehow along the process got close uh, to these concepts because these mm -hmm. concepts at the end of the day, they're related to whatever the, the, the neural network is doing. Uh, now, the, the, the important thing is we, we, we are not, it, neither one way or the other, we are really not touching the, the main network, okay? That's okay. something that we might want to do in the future, right. but for now, uh, to guide it in order maybe yeah, to that's make what I was thinking. To extract these concepts, yes, but mm -hmm. we haven't uh, done that uh, at this point, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, but, but the idea is that mapping networks require few label and training data. And then the, 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 the other very interesting question was to, to investigate whether these extracted concepts actually correspond to our understanding of the concepts. We all know cases where it's learning something, but from spurious correlations, which have nothing to do with our understanding of the concepts. And what we did was we used, I mean, a typical occlusion uh, method in order to generate some heat maps. And what we uh, observed, and this was just by human direct observations, was that in most of uh, the cases, uh, uh, we were just by looking at these heat maps, we could confirm that the mapping networks were looking at the right place in the image to identify particular concepts. Okay, if I remember correctly, I think it was in ninety-four percent of the cases, uh, the, the 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 mapping networks were looking at the right place, and in the other ones, they weren't. They were just looking at somewhere else. Okay. Uh, so again, it, it, it provides a good, again, good evidence that these mapping networks are doing their job and they're looking at the right uh, places when uh, when uh, looking uh, when when extracting these concepts. But of course, I mean, like we all know, this there's no guarantee that this is this is going to happen. Sometimes uh, these uh, networks they may extract the concept, but not by looking at the right place in the image, but by looking at something completely uh, different. Uh, then, and, uh, going back to something that we talked about before, we uh, we, we looked into, uh, into the possibility of not looking at all the neurons of the main network, but only look at the subset of them. Of course, if we only look at the subset of them, it will make the classifiers even simpler. So it will just make uh, things a lot more simple to train the mapping networks. And we devised in that first paper, it's a very simple procedure. Uh, uh, we call it input reduce. Uh, and it's a very simple procedure just to look at the subset of neurons uh, in order before, to, to, as the input for the main uh, networks. And what we were able, just with that very simple procedure, and by now, we have uh, other procedures that work much better than that one, both in terms of complexity of reducing the number of neurons, but also in terms of accuracy. But uh, just uh, to give uh, this table kind of shows on this column over here, the, the, the number of neurons of the main network of the dense part, and here the number of neurons that we have to look at as input to the mapping network in order to obtain an accuracy that as you can compare both, it's quite similar. So you see that sometimes we can just look at two neurons in order to extract, extract a particular concept. Uh, interestingly, in this one, in the neural network of type B, it was much trickier in the sense that we needed a lot more neurons in order to get uh, comparable accuracy. But in all these cases, it's a number that is significantly lower than looking at all the at all the neurons in the main network. So somehow this allows us to conclude that it's possible to pinpoint a subset of neurons that are necessary, and we don't have to look at uh, the other ones. So can you give an intuition on this procedure? I mean, this is, of course, a really nice result. You're getting a huge well, reduction. This one is actually very naive because it starts 
with neurons in the last layer, okay? And iteratively is replacing neurons of the last layer by neurons of the previous layer as long as they uh, react more to that particular concept, okay? Uh, so it's, it's, it's very simplistic, very time consuming and slow, okay? Uh, but uh, uh, so, but it's as simple as that. So we fix a number, uh, uh, not, we don't fix a number of neurons. We have a maximum number of neurons and then we kind of replace neurons uh, as, uh, as needed uh, in order to keep that particular accuracy, okay? So it, it's really nothing very fancy. Uh, we are now finishing a bunch of experiments, trying different methods. Some of them that have, are from the literature uh, methods that, that, that allow you to, to pinpoint how, how, uh, uh, how significant, if you wish, a particular concept is to, to sorry, a particular neuron is uh, to a particular concept. And, uh, and, and, and we hope to have uh, uh, more uh, stable or more sound results because at the end of the day, this method is really, really complex, okay? Because it has to try all sorts, it has to search for a very large uh, search space. Um, so uh, with these experiments, basically, uh, so far, we were able to show that relevant concepts are extracted with higher accuracy values. So it indicates that the concepts are kind of there in the main network, that the mapping networks require fuel label training data than if we were to extract the concepts from the data set, uh, that these concepts kind of... Uh, correspond to our intuition and that we only need a few neurons in order to uh, to to extract the concepts okay so this is the the, the the initial picture now the question is what can we do with these mapped concepts okay and here there are the, the first thing that we 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 thought about because our initial idea uh, was that we have some ontology about uh, all this domain with the semantic web and all the ontologies that are around, likely there would be some ontology about this domain. So our first thought was, okay, if there's some ontology and we extract the concepts uh, corresponding to that ontology, uh, then we can just give this ontology together with the extracted concepts to uh, an abduction system or pinpointing, an axiom pinpointing system to generate explanations, okay? And in this view, the idea of an explanation would be a minimal set or a minimal subset of the ontology of the background knowledge that together with the concepts extracted through the mapping networks would be able to allow us to conclude the output of the main network, okay? So a very simple idea, as long as we have this ontology. and using the ontology that was coming with the data set, we tried to see uh, how good the explanations were. So here's just an example of an explanation. So for this image, we uh, observed long train and freight train. And we know that there's an axiom that says that long freight train is equivalent to long train and a freight train. This comes from the ontology. And the ontology also says that type P, which is the output of the, this network, is composed of either passenger trains or long freight trains. So this would be the explanation that we construct for the user. So the user with this would know, besides the, the what was in the ontology, would know that it's a type P train because it's a long freight train, because it was identified as a long train and a freight train, and not because it was a passenger train, okay? So we did this for uh, uh, all our images. And what we were able uh, to conclude is that these explanations were correct in most cases, okay? So, uh, of course, when, you, when you're pinpointing these axioms and you're trying to find minimal uh, sets that would explain the output, there might be more than one of these minimal sets. And what we conclude in this first column was the, the cases where all the minimal sets corresponded to correct explanations. Then these are cases where the minimum, uh, the minimum uh, set uh, of axioms uh, or some of them would be uh, uh, correct, okay? 
this is the cases correspond to the cases where none of them was correct. And the last one was where we couldn't find any justifications, for example, because uh, the, the, there was nothing in the observations or in the concepts that we mapped from the, 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 the mapping networks that were enough to together with some axioms to conclude the output, okay? So again, uh, this kind of points that these explanations were correct in most, uh, uh, in most cases. So uh, th th this was kind of our first paper, but then there's a very important question begging to be asked, which is what if we don't have the background knowledge? What if we don't have the ontology with uh, the concepts that are known to this particular person for whom we're trying to uh, uh, explain the, 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 the neural network? And here, the interesting part is that, uh, at least to me, it, it might even be more interesting what we can do with this, not using the ontology than using the ontology. Because think about this, with this setup, so if we have the, the mapping, the, the main network and the mapping networks, what we can do at the end of the day is we can let the entire data set go through this network and we can use the the mapping networks, the output of the mapping networks to create additional labels for the data set. So these are now labels that are just completely dependent on the process of the main network and the mapping networks, okay? So it means that now the images can be replaced with a data set containing all the labels for the extracted concepts and the classification, which is the output of the main network. So now what we can do is just simply give this to an inductive system, a DL learner, for example. So a logical inductive system that takes as input all this data set now just composed of symbolic concepts and an output and induce a theory, okay? And this theory, we hope, is going to be much closer to what's going on inside the network than using this ontology. Uh, that we were reusing uh, from somewhere else. And then the rest of the process is the same. We give it to an abduction system or a pinpointing system to generate explanations, okay? And, uh, and of course, now the important question is, does it work, okay? And again, we conduct a series of experiments. I will be very quick in, in, in telling you at least the, the, the main ones because they're quite interesting, okay? Now, the first one was uh, to, to, to see whether we could induce theories that were somehow faithful, okay? That made any sense. And just to remind you, this was the data set ontologies, just at the top level, the type A, type B, and type C ontologies. And what we did was we created, actually we reused the 11 mapping networks that we've done before. Some of them with good accuracy, some of them not with so good accuracy, but we trained them and we use them nevertheless. And we gave the data set labeled now, according to these uh, mapping, mapping networks, we gave it to DL learner to learn the ontologies. And this was the result, okay? So for type A, this is the what DL learn gave us, for type B, this one, and for type C, this one. So here's some interesting points. First, only three out of the 11 concepts were used on average. So this kind of indicates that the learner was able to separate the mapping, the mappings, the, the concepts extracted that were not really uh, relevant or important from the ones that were. So bear in mind that these inductive systems, they always try to find minimal axioms to explain uh, the, the, the data set. So only three out of 11 concepts were used on average. And then interestingly is type A and type C are equivalent to the one in the data set, whereas type B is a subclass of the one in the data set. But so was there anything in the data set that was outside of the subclass? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, and, but more interestingly is to look at the fidelity uh, scores, okay? And uh, let's focus on the, this column on the left. This is the relevant one. What you see is that the fidelity scores are very, very high. This means that classifying the data set using the learned ontology uh, gives you a very good accuracy uh, 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 or it, it's, it's, it gives you almost the same result as if you classified using the main 
network. Okay. So they're, they're highly faithful, these logic-based theories that we induced. Now, another interesting question is uh, the importance of these uh, mapped concepts. So here, all these concepts that we used were mostly uh, train level concepts. So I didn't point this, but the ontology has the type A, type B, type C types of trains. Then it has some train level concepts, some wagon level concepts, and it goes uh, down. So one interesting experiment we did was we tried to do the same process just using train level concepts versus just using wagon level concepts. Okay. So in, on the left side, the train level concepts, we created mapping networks for these uh, concepts over here, higher level. And on the other side, we train mapping networks for lower level concepts, or we call wagon level uh, concepts, okay? So we call that the ontology then relates the, the, the train to the wagon level, but this is not known. We know it from the outside. So when we gave this, these were the learned ontologies, okay? So let me point to the important part. At the train level, they're all equivalent to uh, the original ones, okay? Which is not completely surprising because these train level concepts, they're concepts that are very close to the output. So this is not really completely surprising. When we looked at the wagon level concepts, what we see is that uh, type B is a subclass of the original one, whereas type A and type C are neither superclasses nor subclasses. So on its own, this would be a bit uh, disappointing, but not really, because what we should look is at the fidelity scores. And what we look is even on the wagon level concepts, the fidelity scores are quite high. So even if logically they're neither equivalent nor subset or superset, when we look at the fidelity scores, what we can observe is that both at the wagon level and at the train level, they're really classifying uh, very close to, uh, to, to the ontology, the learned ontology, very close to what the mapping, to, to what the main network is classifying the samples, okay? So this points to the fact that we can actually learn theories with different levels of abstraction using this uh, particular uh, method, okay? Now, one interesting point is also what happens if we don't, uh, if we don't get uh, good uh, concepts being extracted, okay? So do the extracted concepts influence the quality of the induced theories, okay? So what we did here, again, this is the data set. We did a series of experiments where we mapped uh, 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 20 random sets of five concepts, okay? So instead of picking the concepts that we were expecting to find uh, there or that would make sense to extract, we just randomly uh, extracted five uh, concepts, and we repeated this 20 times. And interestingly, uh, well, not surprisingly, of course, uh, that the average fidelity scores dropped considerably, okay? So here, now our fidelity scores were just in the low 70s on average. So just to give you an example, when these were the concepts, it doesn't matter what they are, but when these were the concepts that we extracted and gave to the L-learner, the L-learner for type A just gave us top so we couldn't get anything beyond just always saying yes by using those concepts. Uh, then, uh, then for type B, it's something closer because one of those concepts was close enough. But interestingly, when you look at the fidelity scores, what you see is that the fidelity scores, of course, of the first one is just 50. It's almost random. The second one, it turns out to be uh, very close because uh, one of the concepts just happens to be this long freight train just happens to be also uh, related to type B and we'd see it was 76%, okay? So this really tells us that the choice of the mapped concepts is reflected in the quality of the theory, okay? So you need to get the concepts right, okay? You need to be looking for relevant concepts in order to be able to have this uh, method functioning uh, because random concepts will take you nowhere. But at the same time, this is, I, I see this as a positive thing because it's its further evidence that uh, uh, what's, what we're doing really has some connection to the concepts that we're extracting 
and it's not just for, for any random thing that we we throw at it okay quite interesting so um well you know what are what are kind of the next steps you think with this line of work okay so there are uh, there's two or three things that we are investigating at the moment one of them is exactly it's almost like addressing this last question of the relevancy of the concepts okay so imagine now uh, that we try a bunch of concepts we try to extract a bunch of concepts that uh, that we thought were relevant and we can't okay so what happens if the network really didn't organize things uh, in order to uh, uh, to learn uh, somehow uh, the, the the concepts that we know uh, what can we do then and what we are trying to do is now look the other way around look for patterns of activations of neurons that might correspond to a particular concept okay or that correspond to a particular concept that the neural network learned and then our idea would be to kind of present uh, uh, evidence or at least indications of what parts of the image those activations correspond to maybe for the user to say oh, okay so that's uh, this is the name of that concept okay so this is the concept that the neural network is learning that i have no idea that uh, it was relevant but this is what it has learned so uh, if we can't map with the concepts that we know of can we still use it for other concepts um, so we're looking at clustering methods in order to figure out uh, clusters of of, of uh, activations that might correspond to a particular concept. So that's one thing. Another thing we're looking at is to use this coupled with other methods that we're looking at in order to do some sort of counterfactual reasoning inside the neural network. Okay, try to figure out uh, not just learn one big axiom that represents the entire network, but perhaps learn uh, uh, rel the relations and causations almost between these intermediate concepts, okay? So for example, try to figure out that the concept of the wagon level concepts will uh, uh, will cause uh, the, the, the train level concepts, or at least they have an effect one or the other. Okay, so that's another thing that we are looking at. And of course, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't want to 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 not mention um, that uh, there's the, 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 all these things that we've done have been ex have been uh, uh, all the experiments that we've conducted have been done with this particular data set. Most of them, all the very thorough, have been done with this data set, which is a synthetic data set, and as such, it uh, it can almost be seen as a simple easy data set. We've tried these methods on other data sets. Uh, uh, for example, we've used it on the German traffic signs data set and a couple of other data sets. And, uh, and uh, they, they work on some cases, not always, but we need to do a lot more thorough experiments with bigger and real world data sets. The reason why we we do not yet have all the experiments in so many data sets is that we still need to label them, okay? And labeling these uh, data sets with what we think are the concepts that might be relevant for a particular classification is really not an easy thing to do. And there aren't that many data sets around with the kind of labels for complex things like that, that, that we require in order for this uh, method uh, to be tested okay so but again it's important to, to see that all these results which were really good uh, uh, on on this data set they've carried out over to the other uh, simple data sets uh, a lot more experiments need to be conducted in order to see how it they function in uh, in more complex uh, more real world uh, uh, data sets oh, that's really interesting um, I mean, kind of makes me wonder about things like uh, hierarchical classification tasks or, um, you know, reasoning about scene graphs. Uh, 
which are problems in machine learning where there is like this inherent structure and, you know, the traditional machine learning stuff just looks, frames it as a multi-class classification problem. I wonder if this could be like a different way to tackle that. Maybe, maybe, but I, I, I don't know enough about it. Okay, so I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, maybe. your reference uh, to the to the traffic uh, signs reminds me of um, the possibility of, of using this this kind of technique to guard against adversarial attacks. You know, where we if you just change a little bit of the image, even a few pixels sometimes, or even like some something similar to to random noise changes, you know, stop sign to a, a you know yield or something, and and in that case. It wouldn't be that I, I think it wouldn't be that difficult to label the concepts, right? What what is a stop sign? It's a you know not a sign with this you know uh, so many sides and uh, you know uh, the word stop on it and then that kind of thing that you could kind of reduce to concepts that that you can then uh, help um, the the network avoid avoid these adversarial attacks. But it's just an idea. Uh, maybe, but uh, so bear in mind that if the main network is not immune to these adversarial attacks, uh, chances are that the mapping networks will just play along and they will map. Right. And they will That's map uh, uh, also the, the adversarial attacks in a yeah, way. Yeah, it goes back to my idea of guiding, of, of doing a different thing. It's not the same thing that you did. It's just a different idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, you know, just to kind of uh, wrap up, you know, this is this is a really uh, compelling area, and I think you know this is um, relates to a bunch of things that we've been talking about on the channel, including like symbol grounding or you know network introspection and, and so forth. Um, you know, if if there's new researchers that are looking to get into this area. What advice would you give them? Like, what things would you tell them to read or courses to take to uh, prepare? Well, I think it's almost circling back to the beginning of our conversation. I think it really helps to have a good understanding of both sides of of AI. Okay, and and it, it's true that many people now are only familiar with either machine learning and very few with just uh, uh, symbolic methods. And, uh, and, and, and it seems to me at the moment that there's such a need for symbolic methods on, in machine learning, and the symbolic people can benefit so much from the machine learning methods that uh, just being very proficient in both uh, worlds and knowing your foundations on both sides just gives you such an advantage for now because the terrain is so fertile and it's so unexplored that to me, that would be the, the main advice. Don't just focus on machine learning or on KR. Try to learn both because there's all sorts of things that can be done, uh, uh, even simple ones, not, uh, not uh, moonshot kind of things, simple ones that would greatly benefit uh, uh, one side and the other. I have, in, in my group, I have, People, senior people are just from machine learning side. And it's interesting how sometimes I have conversations with them and they're just uh, kind of trying to come up with an idea of what a rule is, <laughs> for example. Uh, they have some idea uh, of what they want and then we tell them, well, but yeah, that's a rule. It's been studied and we can tell them a lot of things uh, um, about them. So knowing both sides is a huge advantage, I would say. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, and I think this is uh, this has been a really uh, great discussion, Joao. So thank you for taking the time. Well, um, thank you for having me. And so uh, to everyone out there, uh, all our uh, subscribers, um, hope you enjoyed this and stay tuned for more content. Thank you very much.